Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of New Books in, in Intellectual History. I am your host, Tejas Parashar. My guest today is Silvana Tomaselli from the University of Cambridge. I'll be speaking to her about her new book, Wollstonecraft, Philosophy, Passion, and Politics. Silvana Tomaselli is the Sir Harry Hinsley Lecturer in History at St. John's College, University of Cambridge. She is interested both in the history of 18th and 19th century political thought and in contemporary political philosophy, particularly around issues of morality, punishment, gender, and feminism. She is the author, most recently, of Wollstonecraft, Philosophy, Passion, and Politics, just published by Princeton in 2021, and the editor of Mary Wollstonecraft, A Vindication of the Rights of Men, and A Vindication of the Rights of Women. The latter two are very important volumes in the Cambridge Texts in the History of Political Thought series. She has also recently published on Adam Smith and Luck in the journal History of European Ideas. Silvana, thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited to chat. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Great. So to begin, uh, could you give us a quick overview of who Mary Wollstonecraft was the topic of, of your latest book, who Mary Wollstonecraft was? Um, she had a tragically short life, didn't she? Yes, she died on um, the 10th of September, 1797, uh, in her late 30s, having given birth to her second daughter, Mary, Mary Godwin, who was to become Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Wollstonecraft herself was born in 1759. She received no formal education, which was not unusual for somebody of her gender and position. She did have um, some lucky, if you wish, um, encounters, which meant that she learned, um, for example, uh, quite a bit of Plato. Uh, Through her reviewing for the analytical review, she was able to read, acquire books and, and read, and therefore ended up being quite a polymath, um, writing on subjects like natural history, uh, topography, um, travel writings, novels, poetry, and so forth. She's best known for a work which she published in 1792, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. She had published a vindication of the rights of men two years earlier, which is a reply to Burke's reflection on the revolution in France. Wollstonecraft thought and described herself as a philosopher and a moralist, and that is how I think one should consider her. So Wollstonecraft was a philosopher and a moralist. Great. And, you know, like many in the history of political thought, I was familiar mostly with Wollstonecraft as the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Men and A Vindication of the uh, Rights of Women, which you just mentioned. But one thing I learned from your book was just how extensive her corpus of writings, in fact, was. I mean, she wrote commentaries on the theater and was also a novelist near the end of her life. So the Wollstonecraft that you present in the book was, I think, much more wide ranging and much and a much more capacious thinking, thinker than the one that at least I was used to. So. Could you just say a little bit more about the, 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 how, how um, widespread the genre of her writings was? Well, she was very influential, for example, as a travel writer. That was because of the success of her letters written from Scandinavia, um, which were published in 1796. Um, she also wrote, as I said earlier, very extensively for the analytical review. And that led her to think about a number of issues, um, race, slavery, um, the theater, representation, education, um, the kind of novels that ought to be published and the kinds of novels that would be best left unpublished. So she, she really is an intellectual and she lived for a short while in um, Newington 
uh, green on your intent green or in that community and had um, therefore the benefit of a the dissenting community which included her publisher who was really her patron Joseph Johnson as well as Richard Price Richard Price of the sermon on the love of our country uh, which partly uh, prompted Edmund Burke to write his uh, reflection in answer to to Price's love of our country. Right. You know, uh, and and one question I had immediately while reading uh, was about the format and structure that you chose for the book. So, So this isn't a standard intellectual biography in that you don't just give us a chronological account of Wollstone's craft's uh, life in the context of the late 20th, 18th century. Instead, you divide the book into four thematic chapters. Why did you choose this format? Well, it took me some time to decide on the format. This was because, in part because I had written quite a number of articles on Wollstonecraft, and I had also been Uh, lecturing on her for many years and to be truthful I was somewhat bored with what I had to say about her and I didn't really want to to risk boring my audience so the question was how could I share what I knew of her um, in a way that was novel and I happened to be looking at her first work, first published work, and note that she herself had written uh, short essays in that work, Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, uh, on topics such as music, the theatre, and uh, the nursery, and so forth. And I thought, why don't I um, use her format to... Um, discuss what she thought of a number of important topics uh, as she saw them. And do you and, uh, did did you find that there was a kind of coherent philosophy that's underlying uh, Wollstonecraft's writings on different topic, or is the case more like Kant, where there is a clear division between the moral philosophy and the more political right, or not a clear division, but. Yeah, I, potential division. Um, do, do you think that the, that Wollstonecraft was working with a coherent worldview even as she was writing about such disparate topics? Well, coherent is a, is a big word. Um, I do think that one of the remarkable things about Wollstonecraft is that she was willing to revise her opinions and to acknowledge as such. So, for example, having been very critical of Burke for what she thought was his uh, love, um, on critical love of the English constitution. When she writes in France about the origins of the French Revolution, she begins by saying that actually the English constitution has much to be um, said for itself and that um, England is the Uh, birthplace of liberty. So you can see her think, and she did that on just about every subject, not to say that she changed her mind on every subject, but she is a thinker who's alive. She's not a thinker who is set in cement. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. So even uh, uh, over the course of her year, uh, of her career, you can see her kind of reevaluating her older views yes, and changing her yes. views across different writings. And another example is when she writes in her letters from Scandinavia, she uh, composed these for Gilbert Imlay, the father of her firstborn, Fanny, mm-hmm. uh, a man who... Um, an American, uh, she passed uh, for his wife in under the terror because American citizens enjoyed a degree more security than uh, British ones in France. Um, but she, they never married. He abandoned her. Um, she traveled to S- uh, Scandinavia partly to find, or not partly, to find a um, 
ship in which he had a large investment and um, which had disappeared as the captain of the ship had absconded with its goods. And there she writes to Imlay, she says, you know, I'm a always been against charity and then she say however and then she qualifies and explains uh, when she thinks charity necessary and acceptable so it's somebody who is conscious of what she's written what she said what she is associated with and keeps on thinking and as i said revises her view in the light of new experiences qualifies them or explains them further. Yeah. I, so I, I want to return the, to the question of Wollstonecraft's specific views in, in a second, but just to stay on her career and on her biography for a little bit more, one, one thing I'm curious about is, is how Wollstonecraft was perceived at the time. Was she a very distinctive public persona? Um, did she attract uh, a lot of der- derision in, by reviewers? I mean, how were both her writings and her personality uh, being understood, both in Britain and, and in the places she traveled at the time? Do we do we have a sense of that? Well, we have a growing sense of her reception, um, not just in the English-speaking world, but but elsewhere. However, you have to remember that her most significant publications occur within um, a. F- the last few years of her life, so uh, 1790, the vindication of the rights of men, 1792, the vindication of the rights of women. And as I said, she dies in 1797. So we're really talking about um, five years of reception. In those Mm -hmm. five years... um, she is is read and taken more seriously, but of course she's not the only person to ask for the rights of of women uh, or women. Um, you have on both sides of the channel a number of authors who are clamoring for this, and um, not least uh, Condorcet, but uh, that's... Um, that will be published later. But nonetheless, you know, it, she's not alone in this. So she w- wouldn't have been seen perhaps as unique as we might think of her today. Then she gains notoriety uh, following her death in uh, when uh, Godwin publishes the, her posthumous works, which includes a, an account of her life and which goes into some detail about her private life, including the fact that she was never married to Imlay. And that um, leads her to be, she she continues to be respected by some, for example, John Stuart Mill will will cite her, but um, this kind of disclosure did not help her reputation for a while. Right. But that did dis- that disclosure and that notoriety was posthumous. It it, it yes, it, yes. It, it didn't occur during her writing career. Yes, um, I mean I can't say that her vindication uh, sold like hotcakes, partly because of, of the time and, as I said, mm-hmm. because it wasn't unique. But nonetheless, uh, she was respected, and of course. Um, not in every circle, because uh, the review, for example, the analytical review, uh, was very much identified with the dissenting community. So it would have depended which community you you belong to. But within what is sometimes called radical circles, um, she would be she was respected. Yeah, and, I mean, it, and just uh, as a follow up, was she? Um, if there were others on both sides of the channel making similar demands as Wollstonecraft made in the vindication of the rights of women, broadly similar demands. But was her career unique? I mean, was she distinctive bio- in her biography, if not necessarily in her views then, just given how wide-ranging her interests were? Well, most w- women I can think of, apart from Olympe de Gouges, 
were married. Alain de Gouche had been married um, at, at some point, but um, Wollstonecraft was not married, so that's number one. Um, she undertook, it, she wasn't the only woman who, to go to uh, France during the French Revolution. Um, you could think of these ladies as um, foreign reporters writing, uh, describing the events in France. However, what would probably be most unique is her traveling with an infant daughter, the first daughter, Fanny, by Imlay, in Scandinavia in search of this ship, this cargo. So in 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 that sense, you know, she was enterprising. She um, she traveled um, early on in life. She had, she went to Portugal to attend to the birth of her uh, the labor of her friend uh, Fanny, after whom her first daughter was born. So you know, she was not travel shy. Uh, she quit her job as a governess in Ireland to the Kingsborough. Um, because she really hated being a governess and she didn't like them much either, though they seemed to be quite kind to her uh, or treat her uh, rather well, according to what she says herself. So, you know, she's bold, she's courageous. Um, she uh, took one of her sisters out of her marriage when she discovered that her sister was being abused. So she's a woman of action. She's courageous, she's bold. And um, all this in um, a very precarious financial uh, situation, circumstances. Right. Does that answer your question? It does, certainly, certainly. I mean, it does give us a sense also of how, um, despite her posthumous popularity, how during her life she, you know, she, uh, she, it, 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 her life was not just tragic because of how short it was, but because of the economic constraints, the social constraints that she lived yes, under. Yes, and, and uh, emotive constraints. Um, yeah. she, you know, we can't go into the biography too, too much, but her, her father was abusive, certainly of her mother, um, and her, her mother died rather young, uh, probably uh, owing to the, the abuse. So, you know, it's 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 not. It was never a bed of roses for mm-hmm. Wollstonecraft, and the only time she sounds as though she's finally found a degree of security is uh, around the time she marries William Godwin. But of course, um, she dies shortly thereafter. Right. Now, I wanted to move into the question of uh, the content of, of Wollstonecraft's views on politics and on society. In chapter two of the book, you write that, quote, Wollstonecraft's belief in the unity of humanity is the stepping stone to understanding her social and political views. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about this. So what did, what did Wollstonecraft mean by the phrase unity of humanity? Well, Wollstonecraft was a believer she believed that God created human beings as equals and that they were bearers of rights as his creatures. So she deplored the slave trade and slavery and any notion that um, human beings were distinct or should be differentiated on the basis of color. So in the you know there's one human race and that is um, a fact of creation. Mm-hmm. Does she mean anything more than that? Well I think she thought that virtue properly understood would be, and in a shared context, obviously, would be uh, deemed so by humanity at large. So it, it would be effectively that we would all end up sharing the same belief had we the same education and the same opportunity. The divisions between human beings, she didn't think human beings were 
equal in the sense of having the same ability and potential at birth and thought that government ought to remedy any inequality or as much as they could, inequalities that resulted from um, these differences uh, between individuals. But given a relatively level playing field, then she would have thought, um, did think, and I'm here I'm, I'm really extrapolating from her views, she didn't say that specifically, uh, that we would all share in effectively one belief system. So it's unity both as created uh, beings, but it's also unity insofar as one might say she's a universalist. Mm. Um, and of course, there's a fairly substantial late 18th century debate on this question of uh, universal diversity, human diversity versus unity. So in the Scottish Enlightenment, we can think of figures like David Hume, Adam Smith, and Lord Keynes, who dealt with this question. We can also think of German texts like Kant's Anthropology from the 1790s. How did Wollstonecraft's theory of unity and her, her universalist views relate to this ongoing conversation about global diversity in the, in the late 18th century? Well, theory is a big word, and, and I wouldn't use theory for Wollstonecraft. She had views. You mm -hmm. have to remember the circumstance. Everything she writes is responsive. Um, it's written very quickly. You know, she's not an academic. Um, and she's not Adam Smith, she, so, and she's not Hume because, unlike Hume, she didn't write a history of England that made some money or essays. Do, do you see? So we're not, we shouldn't be looking for theories and, and somebody who is trying to um, make sense or somehow or other accommodate her views to um, ongoing conversation. It's, she's responding much more to her own experience and to political ev events. So beyond saying what I have about the unity of mankind um, and our equality before God um, and the fact that we are rights bare because of, of that, um, she doesn't really develop that theory. She, it's more that she responds to either um, institutions, if that's the right word, e.g. slavery, or uh, those who argue that, um, or racists. So I did want to follow up on the slavery uh, point. So were there overlaps between Wollstonecraft's language of human unity and the rhetoric of anti-slavery campaigners from the late uh, 18th century onwards? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, the more I study her, and indeed others, the more I think that feminism, as we, to use a broad term, or the, those who call for the rights of women are beholden to um, abolitionism. It, the whole register mm. um, of a call for their rights and freedom is one that comes straight out of abolitionist discourse. And in fact, Wollstonecraft decried slavery, the slave trade, before she ever wrote anything about uh, the rights of, of, of women. And the analogy between women and slave runs throughout the vindication of the rights of women. Again, she's not unique in this, but it's very pronounced in her case. Mm, and uh, was she uh, ever engaged in her life with abolitionist movements? Uh, not to my knowledge, but perhaps I'm not the best person uh, to um, to speak on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did find it striking how just the language of uh, equality before God and, uh, and the idea of universal brotherhood, uh, that was just so prominent within abolitionist movements, right? And, yeah. and it's really striking that that's the language that Wollstonecraft both uses and then develops in new directions. Quite, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, in yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, well, it's quite interesting in relation to liberty. If you look, uh, as I was asked relatively recently about her ideas uh, of liberty, 
-hmm. liberty is very much thought as being one's own person. And then that isn't just a question of not being owned by anyone else or being subjected subjected, uh, to somebody else's will. But it's also, and here the link is perhaps not so much uh, abolitionist as uh, purely um, as um, Christian and then Platonist, um, mm. the idea of not being slave to one's own desire to effectively emancipate oneself from false belief, false desires, false notion of the end of life, uh, the purpose of life, false notion of um, the merit of wealth and, and, and happiness. And this, of course, you find uh, uh, not least in, in Adam Smith and, and others. So again, not unique, but um, interesting nonetheless. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, when you know, the, uh, uh, another thing that I um, gained from your book was just the proximity that Wollstonecraft had to uh, radical religious circles. I mean, figures like Richard Price, who you mentioned earlier. Uh, of, of course, there's the kind of Venn diagram where abolitionism, religious reform within Protestant uh, uh, radical Protestant circles, and and Wollstonecraft emerging what we might call feminism or thinking on gender intersects. Um, but it is it is striking how she's kind of triangulating this, <laughs> the th- her thinking on gender, her thinking on slavery, and her thinking on uh, religion. Yes, absolutely. Though, I mean, speaking of of Price, you know, she wasn't uncritical of him because Price in his sermon, there's a part of the sermon that is really discussed. The first part is, you know, he's it's wonderful. We got that. We had the glorious revolution with the American Revolution. Now we have the French Revolution. You know, it's very anti-papist. So the Antichrist is being defeated world over, and uh, you know, it's the uh, forward march of uh, rational. Cri- Christianity. But then in the second part, he says, oh, you know, isn't it a shame that our heroes, our political heroes, are not actually virtuous in their uh, private life? Uh, so he's thinking of uh, figures such as Fox and, and his womanizing. And then he um, slips. Um, of course, at least, you know, one would wish that they would hide their, um, he doesn't use the word sinfulness, but uh, I can't remember what it is, but it's in that register. And Wilson Craft um, really, you could think uh, of the vindication of the rights of woman as a answer in part to Price to say, look, <laughs> you know, the world is never going to change if we don't think uh, about what is necessary as a moral revolution. So we need a thorough revolution, not just a political revolution, not even uh, just a social and economic revolution, but we need a moral revolution. Mm. Mm. Fascinating. And this, this is actually a theme that you then pick up in chapter three of the book, um, where you remind us that a vindication of the rights of women opens with what we might call the civilization question, right? Um, which again, was, was a kind of common 18th century preoccupation. We can think of Rousseau's second discourse here. Could you say a little bit about what was the importance of civilization for Wollstonecraft? What was the what she saw as the corruptions of modern civilization and how she related it to the gender question? Wollstonecraft didn't think that all was wrong with the world, but she certainly didn't think all was right. And that what is and isn't right is difficult to for her to spell out clearly. Uh, she certainly is not against the advancement of science. She certainly appreciates the visual arts and theater and music. So it's not a condemnation of knowledge of the arts and sciences. So it's not a Rousseauian position. It isn't the view that everything that one might think is positive about the world is actually corrupting um, or an attempt to remedy the corruption of the world, the production effectively of um, cures uh, for which um, 
the, the cause for which are man-made. So there are many things about the world that she very much enjoys and wants everyone to be able to enjoy. So the issue of civilization with her is, as she put it, that it's very uneven. So it's not just uneven in the sense that Price, even Price, whom she respects very much, comes up with the comments I've I've mentioned just now, but it's also that it's unevenly distributed within um, a population such as Europe's. So you have great uh, gap between, um, initially I should say, she's just very much uh, quite anti-French, uh, partly because of the Catholicism and all that, but um, when she travels to um, Scandinavia, she comes to think differently of uh, France and um, maybe um, Southern Europe. In fact, if I may say, she thought that if one wanted to see the history of civilization through travel, one should, and I hope none of your listeners uh, will be offended by this if they come from Scandinavia, but uh, (laughs) one should start, you know, uh, from Scandinavia and then travel down and then one would see um, or experience rather for oneself directly um, at the progress of human civilization. Mm. Um, But I've forgotten what I was saying uh, before this um, intervention, but I I think what I was trying to say is that the the unevenness is the fact that you have, whether it's in Sweden or in Ireland or in in France or uh, in in London, um, a very uneven distribution of the benefits, the fruits of, of progress in the arts and sciences. Yeah, I mean, I I was really struck by that. This is an aspect of Wollstonecraft, uh, which I hadn't appreciated um, to the extent that I should have. I mean, this this idea that there is a, a, a une- that, that unequal property relations and the nature of commercial society fundamentally corrupts modern, the ben- whatever benefits might be coming from modern civilization. Yeah. Right. And so the, the problem of inequality is, is, is something that that exacerbates it sort of it sort of def, it defeats the purposes of modern civilization itself quite property for her is the root of all evil um, they said she didn't want to abolish private property uh, she did think there should be efforts to in to towards redistribution so one of the things she thought was that common man should be redistributed mm. uh, we don't have very much on this from her, but um, I think the whole tenor of her uh, view is that there should we really need to on, um, tackle um, material um, economic inequality. This wasn't just for the poor, it was actually of course, she had to address the rich. Who is going to read her, her work except people who are at least in position to uh, to own books or, or or know how to read, so she has to uh, cater to her readers. But nonetheless, I think she is sincere when she thinks that really it's not good for the rich to um, be idle, it's not good to be parasitical, and it's not good to have um, people effectively beneath one. That that's not good for for one spirit. It's not, it it atrophies one uh, emotionally, morally. So for all these reasons, uh, something needed to be done. So what I try to do in the book is to say there are, uh, if you wish, two Wollstonecraft. Um, th- there is a Wollstonecraft who is eager to have at least some changes, however minor. You know, give women uh, the opportunity to acquire some skills so that if they don't want to marry, they don't have to, they can support themselves, or should they become widows, they should be able to support themselves and their families. You know, if she said, uh, it's, it's, you know, either that or nothing, she would have gone for, for that. So there are, if, if there is a 
limited or piecemeal proposal, but there is also Wollstonecraft who th- thinks about um, more fundamental changes, um, decentralization, and we've already touched on um, not the abolition, but a, a, a degree of redistribution of property, uh, greater representation, representation of, of, by women, of women, um, greater political knowledge and participation. So it's a, you know, quite a vision, uh, not uh, developed. Uh, I'm pretty sure she would have developed this though with the qualification that the hints which we have towards a second volume of the Vindication of the Rights of Woman seems to be mostly about aesthetics, um, theory of the mind. She loved philosophy. Uh, she mentions Kant. And, you know, she, she may well have gone in that direction rather than um, the p- more political um the more political one. Mm. And did she link the property question to the gender question as it were? I mean, I, I dislike oh, putting absolutely. things as that, questions. Um, but, yeah. That is, uh, comes out very, very clearly in the mitigation of the rights of men. Uh, she attacks Burke for uh, being a uh, not the, the, the champion of liberty as one might have thought, uh, he was prior to his reflection, but really the champion of property. And in the course of this, um, surprisingly enough, because you would have thought that a critique of uh, Berg's reflection uh, didn't really have room to discuss uh, marriage, um, she talks about marriage and what property does um, in aristocratic or families that have property, uh, one because they think of um, marriage as a way of enlarging their property, so uh, affective relations are, or supposedly affective relations, are used as a way of aggrandizing oneself materially. And secondly, because of inheritance, she decries male primogeniture, but in any event, because of inheritance, there is a false, it warps the relationship between parent and child, because the children are effectively uh, slavish, uh, you know, try to endear themselves to their parents, perhaps uh, to um, eclipse their siblings and so on. So money is is problematic, wealth is problematic at the very beginning of one's life um, when one is either trying to secure the inheritance or one's parents are organizing uh, marriages so as to maintain the family and preferably um, aggrandizing it. Mm. So is it fair to say that she saw the problems of uh, gender relations in the tw- in the 18th century as particularly worse within landed aristocratic classes, that wealth kind of exacerbates an existing social problem? Yes, although it wasn't just the aristocracy or the uh, landed gentry because she thinks as many do, that the middle classes right, of course. ape uh, their, their social betters or try mm. to ape the social betters. So the problem is is widespread. Mm. Um, obviously, the, the destitute, uh, this may not co- come into to, to this, but of course, um, you know, property relations always matter and marriage can always even amongst those who have very little, or perhaps especially amongst those who have very little, uh, is a way of possibly improving one's condition. So it it wouldn't just be um, the aristocracy or the landed uh, gentry. However, Mm -hmm. the reason why she focuses on that, quite apart from the fact that she thinks the middle classes ape the the classes uh, supposedly above them, is that she wants to 
undermine what she takes Burke's commitment to the aristocracy and to the belief that they are uh, the natural ruling class. So it's a uh, it's written in in great haste, you know, in a matter of a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, it's not the most perfect uh, theory, but it's important to her, and really the the vindication of the rights of men is an attack on Burke. Uh, it's not really a, a, a defense of rights. She just says that we human beings have rights. She asserts them. It's not a, a defense. You wouldn't turn to that work to to find a, a reason, a elaborate. You'd be better off going to John Locke, uh, uh, who must have influenced her, or who did influence her. But what it is, it's an attack on every aspect of of Burke's, not just the reflection, but also his um, essay on the origins of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, in which uh, Burke uh, says that we I identified uh, the idea of beauty with smallness and, and fragility, and that women knew this, and women use this and manipulate this and, and, and pretend to be weak so as to um, make their way in the world or achieve their ends. Uh, incidentally, uh, Wollstonecraft says, you know, it's not that I think women don't have power. They do have power. It's a wrong kind of power. It's slavish power. It's the power of sway. I don't want them to have sway. I don't want them to have that kind of uh, you know, behind the scene, uh, pillow talk kind of power. I want them to have power as rational beings worthy of, of respect. So all this to say that she, the, her attacks in the vindication of the rights of men are to anything that she thinks um, will undermine Burke as an authority. Mm. And how does one move towards a more egalitarian uh, social order then? Um, is there, what is the place of the political here in, in, in Wollstonecraft's vision? I mean, you mentioned that in her uh, response and in her interaction with Richard Price, she underlined the need for moral reform as opposed to simply political or even simply social reform. Um, so what kinds of transformations are needed, both at the social level and at the individual level, to change the corruptions of modern society? Well, again, let me stress, we're not talking about a theorist who, you know, had tenure and, and uh, sabbaticals trying to uh, <laughs> sort this one out. They, they, it, there are snippets here and there in response. And she also, you know, she has to make a living. So uh, she she's writing uh, to order, uh, if you see what I mean. So the most important thing the first step, I suppose, would be to know that what is happening in France is not going to achieve the overt aims of the French revolutionary. Um, certainly, and this is what she writes in her dedication to Talleyrand, to the second edition of the Vindication of the Rights of Woman. We need a moral revolution. So in order to have a moral revolution, we need schools. We need children to be schooled from an early age. Um, they have to be mixed schools. Uh, the reason for this is that she thought that single-sex institutions tended to increase lasciviousness. So we need to educate children together and um, have early marriages to ensure that, or to minimize um, um, seduction of vulnerable women and, and so forth. So that would be the kind of project, and certainly uh, the educational project uh, is, is, is the first step, the pedagogical one, which she puts forward or uh, uh, sketches out in the Vindication of the Rights of Women. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about her uh, the nature of her um, views on the French Revolution. I mean, like all other figures of her time, she's 
profoundly shaped by by its transformations. She also lived through the terror, as as you mentioned, uh, and and you reminded us. Uh, and she ends up writing a book on the revolution in 1794. So, what is what what's her more general stance on on the French, this French Revolution? Is it primarily this uh, question of moral revolution and pedagogy um, on which she focuses? Well, I I, I wouldn't put it quite like that. Um, so the, the first thing is, as I said, in relation to the vindication of the rights of men, is to attack those who are, and Burke is the uh, principal target, those who attack the French Revolution. And you remember that uh, Burke is writing in the very early stages uh, of the French Revolution. So to the degree that he dismisses the women involved, to the degree that he dismisses the members of the National Assembly, to the degree that he seems to venerate uh, Queen Marie Antoinette and all that, she wants to attack that. So the first issue is attacking those who are criticizing, attacking any aspect of what's going on in France. Once she goes to France, she realizes that really one class has a group of people has taken over from another. And it turns out that these people are actually considerably worse, considerably more self-interested, considerably more ignorant than the previous lot. So um, it's not <laughs> her view evolve, um, if, if you wish, though it's not clear that she thought um, that clearly well about the French Revolution at its onset. It was more that she was critical of those who dismissed it for what she thought were the wrong reasons. And how did she, um, or does she, see gender as playing out um, in the French Revolution, over the course of the French Revolution? Well, that's a... Not a good question. I, um, I I don't know what the answer to that is. I I suspect it. She doesn't think of it as a. So, well, she doesn't think it as a particularly gendered in the, a particularly gendered term. Or you could say the opposite that her vindication, the dedication to Talleyrand, uh, to the second edition, um, actually shows that a revolution led by men only about uh, political changes or changes, if you wish, in the uh, office holders is not going to achieve the overt aims of the French Revolution. So um, in that sense, uh, for as long as women are excluded, for as long as they're not educated for as long as the world is effectively um, carrying on as it was uh, with, you know, the kind of coup d'etat, rather bloody, but, you know, the coup d'etat, uh, change of personnel at the top, then um, it's as it's not going to be a, an advancement of all the things she holds dear. So in that sense, it's uh, gender figures very much at the heart. So you can have it effectively, you can answer both ways, but the more I hear myself speak, the more I think um, it's very important. Mm. So, and and I mean, that also links up with the more general question of political versus re- uh, moral reform, which you were discussing earlier. Yes, she, she did, does think she's a moralist. Um, what the connotations of that term were then um, are, I think are different from what they might be today, but not entirely different. And she, she's not embarrassed. She's proud of being a moralist. Right. Now, as you note in the book, uh, Wollstonecraft is sometimes considered the first uh, English feminist writer. Um, now, while being attentive to the pitfalls of imputing contemporary labels onto 18th century thinkers, I, I wonder if uh, if you could say a little bit more generally about what keeps drawing you back to Wollstonecraft. I mean, is there anything, uh, do you find much anything distinctive in her voice, both in relation to the history of thinking on gender and politics, but also more broadly in the history of uh, political and, and social thought? When I first was asked to publish 
on Walton Grove or edit for the Cambridge series, I was asked to edit the vindication of the rights of woman. It soon became apparent to me that the vindication of the rights of men were essential to an understanding of a vindication of the rights of woman. And um, I've said this in, in, in writing, but were there to be a, a fire and ha- were I to choo- have to choose between saving the vindication of the rights of men or the vindication of the rights of women, I would choose the former. The reason for this is because there is everything and more in the vindication of the rights of men. It's a much shorter work, to be sure, and it doesn't uh, it contain all the diatribes against uh, pedagogical works uh, for um, young gentlemen and, and women or ladies uh, that the vindication of the rights of women does. But nonetheless, I think it's a very, very important work. It's a very important work because it forces us to think about notions, concepts such as beauty, such as the sublime. It forces us to think or encourages us to think about relations of dependency, of patronage, of what it does um, to, um, a say, a, a companion, older companion, say a cleric, who um, accompanies a young nobleman uh, on the Grand Tour. Uh, she argues, she uses this example to, of course, as I said earlier, yet another thing to get at Bert. But the point is here I want to make is that she encourages us to think about a lot of things that we ought to think about and don't always. One couldn't turn to that book, uh, that small volume written in haste in difficult circumstances uh, for answers, but one certainly would go to it to, uh, you know, should one need to be prodded to think hard about a lot of the concepts that are essential to our social, political, and indeed emotional makeup. Mm. So there's a real problem in the kind of pigeonholing of Wollstonecraft that sometimes happens, of, of pigeonholing her, casting her as merely a thinker of gender relations or, or someone reflecting on gender relations in the late 18th century. Absolutely. But I hate to say this because it makes it sound as though it's not good enough to think about the rights of women or the condition of women. And that is the last thing I want to be seen as arguing. This said, I think we do a disservice to Wollstonecraft's views on women and the condition of women if we don't see her larger views about the things we've been talking about, about property, about inequality, about the unity of uh, the human race, about uh, relationships, uh, about marriage, about the relationship between parent and child. So all of these things, because that is, these are the considerations that she brings to her understanding of the problem uh, uh, with the world as it is in relation to women. But it isn't just a problem in relation to women, because it's a problem in relation to uh, men uh, just as well. Men are atrophied human beings differently from uh, women, but nonetheless, they too uh, suffer under the same delusions uh, to different institutions, different um, aspects, but nonetheless, it's not as though she wants... uh, women to be uh, a seed to the the life and and conceptions that men to the life of men and the conception they they hold so we need a total transformation if we want to actually improve the condition of half the human species yeah no i, I as a reader that's some definitely something that came came across to me in the book that for me, I mean, the, as as I mentioned at the very beginning, that the what, what struck me um, in the book was just that the power of Wollstonecraft 
lay in just how capacious her vision was, how 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 she linked disparate spheres of human life and of so, of social organization to each other. Hmm. Not always in the most coherent way, of course. Not as not as someone who's building a theory of human society or anything like that, but just in 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 terms of uh, the the ways that her moral vision encompassed, uh, you know, property, yeah. commerce, yeah. gender, education. Quite, and I think, in many ways, the fact that it's not a very smooth, complete, consistent, coherent, and all these things, kind of academic exercise or theory. It makes it a, a more a fruitful, a more um, encouraging um, text or set of texts or set of ideas, you know, because it it there's a kind of openness when she, you know, she knows her mind and she will say what she thinks, but at the same time, it it doesn't close. Um, the discussion, you, you don't feel as though there's some great authority telling you, uh, you know, what your view should be of property or uh, civilization, partly because it, it's always in a form of a, or mostly in a form of a diatribe. So, you you know, you can join the conversation and you can have your own thoughts. Um, there's something to be said about this modality. Right, of course. And finally, uh, what are you working on uh, on now for your next project? Well, I wrote some time ago on Montesquieu, and I want to return to Montesquieu. I want to return to Montesquieu. It, it, it's a daunting because the literature on Montesquieu is is phenomenal for many reasons. Um, partly because he is associated with ideas such as the division of powers, but I'm very interested and always was about the way in which he links the condition of women to the rest of a society. So there is a very close link in his view between the degree that any um, so, so the, the, that women in any society enjoy and the overall uh, political and social system in which they, they live. The other thing that interests me, and of course this has been topical for a long, long time, um, but um, it's perhaps um, more on our mind than, than ever, given what's happening in parts of the world. But, you know, the lesson that Montesquieu uh, has been trying to give us for the last uh, 200 years, is it? Yeah, something like that, um, is that um, you can't do regi- regime changes. You can't just, you know, politics and society is not like going to a pick and mix shop and you'll have a bit of this and a bit of that and put it all together, that you have to have a real understanding of the history of a people, of its uh, geography, of its terrain, of its religion, of its, and you know, you name it, and also of its climatic condition. Now, he doesn't think about climate the way we need to today, but he did think about climate and was um, laughed out of the room by uh, some of his contemporaries about the way he talked about, you know, the relationship between living in a cold or hot country and, say, slavery. And one can laugh to this day. Nonetheless, he thought about it. Hmm. Excellent. Well, looking forward to both those projects. Thank well, you. thank you. So- Thank you so much for joining us today, Silvana. This was a pleasure and congratulations on a wonderful and very important book. Oh, thank you very much. I'm delighted uh, you think so.